Bosnia in the Middle Ages was essentially Little Serbia, with some added Catholic and heretical flair. However, what Serbia went through in some 600 years, Bosnia went through in about 200. Luckily for my sanity, there are nowhere near as many Bosnian rulers as there are Serbian, and this video will definitely not be 14 minutes long like the last one. I will be covering bonds and kings of Bosnia starting with Stefan I and ending with Stefan Tomasevic. Titular kings after 1463 will not be included, neither will be the Herzogs of St. Sava. That's only 20 rulers this time, so I might just survive it. Number 21. Priezda I. He was installed after a Catholic crusade against Bosnia, despite himself being a heretic. He quickly converted and tried to suppress the heresy, but when you spit in the face of your subjects, you never end up in a good spot. Since he was so disliked, the Hungarian king stripped him of most of his predecessor's lands and let him keep just a tiny portion, and later said king even forced him to abdicate. Unlucky. Number 20. Helen. Her reign was kind of an interregnum. Not a very good one, though. Just like in Serbia, nobles used the weakness of the ruler to assert themselves and gain lands and titles. In reality, the nobles made the most decisions in the country and called most of the shots. They eventually killed her out of power. Number 19. Dabish. Most of the things that Tvrtko fought to achieve during his reign were undone when Dabisha came to power. The Dalmatian territories were reconquered by the Hungarians, and Bosnia had to become a vassal once again. But hey, at least he stopped an Ottoman invasion. You have to count your wins as well. Number 18. Priezda II The already minuscule realm of Priezda I was split among his two sons Priezda and Stefan. Well, not for long because Priezda died only three years later. Number 17. Mladen I his brother Pavla gave him Bosnia to rule after pushing back Stefan III. I don't really consider this a favor, because Mladen was now forced to fight against the Bosnian heretics and is still pretty much alive Stefan. He was killed in battle with the heretics. Number 16. Stefan II During his reign, the heretical Bosnian church greatly spread throughout Bosnia and Hungary. Stefan, however, was a Catholic, and unlike his father, didn't tolerate the heretics much. They grew more radical and when the Pope called for a crusade against them, they overthrew Stefan and placed one of their own on the throne. Number 15. Vuk. He came to power after the Bosnian nobility dethroned Tvrtko. Not long after, Tvrtko came back with a Hungarian army and took his throne back. Surprisingly, Tvrtko and Vuk actually had nothing against each other and would remain very close even after that. Number 14. Mladen II. He inherited the Banat of Bosnia from his uncle Mladen in 1304 and the Banat of Croatia from his father Pavel in 1312. He didn't really excel in ruling either. And other powers such as Hungary and Venice chipped away pieces of his land every so often. He knew that he couldn't keep everything, so he tried to at least save some territories by leaving Bosnia and giving the Banat back to Stefan IV. A wise decision, leaving Bosnia that is. Number 13. Stefan Ostojic He had great ambitions of conquest and tried to make major alliances. However, he was opposed by half the nobles and was ousted very quickly. Number 12. Radiwe. With Ottoman support, he tried to usurp Tvrtko II and managed to become the de facto ruler of Bosnia for a little while. However, as soon as the Ottomans stopped supporting him, he was pushed back. He remained in Bosnia and held a high place at court after his brother was elected king after Tvrtko died. Number 11. Ostoy This man wasn't very popular among the Bosnian nobility, so much so that they even overthrew him. The Hungarian king restored him after Tvrtko I mysteriously disappeared and would rule until his death some years later. During his first reign, he tried to subdue the nobles, so naturally he was immediately deposed. During his second reign, he didn't really care, he just let them do their thing. He might have wanted to try again and assert his dominance, but he died soon after. Number 10. Stefan III Inherited half of the realm when his father abdicated, and the other half when his brother died. Though, he wouldn't hold neither half for long, because the Croatian man Paolo Šubić attacked him and tried to usurp his title. Stefan didn't have much luck in battle against him and lost almost his entire realm. To his credit though, he managed to keep a few castles and a tiny chunk of land, and even managed to defy the Šubić family until his very death. He was also married to a Serbian princess, which gave his descendants legitimacy to claim the throne of Serbia later down the line. Number 9. Boric Originally, Boric wasn't even from Bosnia, and was most likely a nobleman from Slavonia who came to power with Hungarian aid. His rule was mainly characterized by wars with Byzantium on the behalf of Hungary, in which he managed to prove himself very capable. However, he lost favor with the king because he supported his rival and was therefore removed from power. Number 8. Stefan Tomasevic You know you're unlucky when you're the final ruler of not one, but two separate countries. If you watched the Serbia video, you might remember that this man was given Serbia just to surrender to the Ottomans two months later. Well, when his dad died, he was given a shot at ruling Bosnia. He proved himself okay, I guess. 
He tried to form alliances with his neighbors in order to repel an eventual Ottoman attack. Mehmed II saw this as a direct insult and therefore conquered Bosnia. Tomasheviz tried to negotiate with him, but Menej wouldn't be nearly as merciful as he was when Tomasheviz surrendered Smederevo. He was executed on the spot. Number 7. Stefan I. The first recorded Bosnian prince. He was a member of the Serbian Vojislavljevic dynasty and a relative of King Bodin, who placed him as his regent in Bosnia. He was on good terms with Vukan, the prince of Raška, but when Bodin died, the two supported different claimants to the throne. Bosnia was basically independent after that, and after the death of Stefan would be ruled by his descendants, which we don't know much about. Number 6. Stefan Turtko II He was the least likely candidate for king, but was nevertheless elected probably because he wasn't very assertive, and the nobility believed that he wouldn't be a threat to their autonomy. That proved to be the case, as he was practically a puppet king, until the Hungarians swept in and had him replaced. He went incognito for a few years until he was re-elected, with a large Ottoman army to help back his claim. During his second reign he tried to subdue the nobles, and, quite surprisingly, he managed. He expanded the royal domain, strengthened the economy slightly, and was the second longest ruling king of Bosnia, only behind Turtko I. The reign of Turtko II, however, was dependent on other powers, such as Hungary and the Ottomans, so when they would cut their support, hardships would ensue. He died in 1443. Number 5. Stefan Tomas Tomas was quite a personality. He was an illegitimate son of Austria, a very good-looking and well-educated man with great ambitions, but was often very reluctant to act and indecisive. His reign was the one that saw the nobles finally subdued, mainly because the most powerful one broke away from the country, and so the king tried to repel the Ottomans. He negotiated with the Pope to be given the Crusader cross and to lead a crusade against the infidels, but then plan went nowhere and the Turks just got more eager to conquer him. Tomas managed to place his son on the throne of Serbia, but when he surrendered and fled, Tomas's reputation was permanently stained. Tomas reigned in relative peace, but the Ottoman conquest was constantly looming overhead and was, at that point, inevitable. Luckily for him, he managed to die before it happened. Number 4. Matej Ninuslav Called the Great Ban, as he defended Bosnia during a time when the majority of its Catholic neighbors joined in a crusade against it. When he got to the throne, he converted to Catholicism, but soon after he reconverted to Bosnian heresy and was used very positively by his subjects. When a crusade was called against him, he retreated into the mountains and waged a guerrilla war against the invaders, and actually very successfully. The crusaders were even forced to retreat after a while because the Bosnians were just too tiresome to deal with. Afterwards, he nominally converted to Catholicism once again, but was very likely still a heretic until the very end. Number 3. Ban Kulin during his 40 years of reign, Bosnia entered into somewhat of a golden age. He welcomed into his realm all of the heretics expelled from Serbia and Hungary, and skillfully evaded papal interference by deceiving the papal legates sent to convert the populace. He encouraged trade with Dubrovnik and all other neighboring countries, and had good relations with them. The standard of living for the Bosnian peasant drastically increased, and he was beloved by his subjects, Catholic, Orthodox or heretic. He also had a good military career, leading Bosnian armies against the Byzantines on multiple occasions. Kulin was a great diplomat, a man of many talents and one of the few actually good Bosnian rulers. The period of his reign is generally seen as a period of great prosperity for Bosnia, and Bosnians consider him one of their very best rulers. It's not very hard to see why. Number 2. Stefan IV If Tvrtko was to Bosnia what Dušan was to Serbia, then Stefan IV can be compared to Milutin. He was a very intelligent politician who worked within the constraints of being both a Hungarian and a Croatian vassal. He also war with Serbia, and when he died, Bosnia was three times larger than it had been before he came to power. He held great prestige and played his enemies against each other, fooling both the Pope and the Bosnian church that he was one of them. Stefan IV was a truly great ruler, and the eventual expansion of Trutko were made possible by Stefan. Number 1. Stefan Trutko. Of course it's him. He is the Bosnian equivalent of Tsar Dusan. He came to rule very young and was seriously endangered by the Hungarian king, whose vassal he was forced to become. Then he was overthrown by the nobility, restored by the king, and during his second reign he would come to shine. Firstly, he had to bring order to the country, subdue the nobles, and solve the heretic problem once and for all. It was during Tvrtko's reign when the Bosnian church lost prominence and the majority of the population converted either to Catholicism or Orthodoxy, mostly Orthodoxy. With the realm stabilized, Tvrtko, who was a descendant of the Nemanjic dynasty and idolized his Nemanjic ancestors, especially Dušan, tried to follow in their footsteps and unite Serbia and Bosnia. Using the power vacuum left behind by Uroš the Weak when he died and making an alliance with Prince Lazar, Tvrtko would significantly expand his realm into Serbia and, by the tomb of Saint Sava, crowned himself the king of both Serbia and Bosnia. 
Then Tvrtko expanded even more into Dalmatia, Hungary and Zeta. Under Tvrtko, Bosnia was the leading South Slavic state in the Balkans and was reminiscent of Serbia's former imperial glory. Tvrtko was a very intelligent and capable ruler, who knew how to use the circumstances he found himself in and enlarge his realm. Unfortunately, just like Dusan, Tvrtko died very suddenly and his country quickly collapsed under Hungarian pressure and struggles among the nobility. Thank you for watching. Next time I'll most likely do Montenegro and conclude this little trilogy that I started. I hope you enjoyed and have a good day.